In this video, I'm gonna share my current workflow for using AI to turn visual designs into working prototypes on my phone without coding them entirely from scratch. If you don't know, my name is Ricky, I'm a designer and engineer, and I'm sharing all the lessons learned building a content planning app. This is my first app ever, so I'm fresh, I'm learning stuff, and I'm sharing it with you. Over these past few weeks, I've moved into a new home that I'm pretty excited about. We've got a lot more space now for like just living, working, and for the dogs to run around. And I also found some time to design a new landing screen for the second tab of my app. I'm gonna go over that in detail, but first I wanted to share how I've been using AI tools like Cursor in my design process. As I work through designing my new iOS app, I need to to validate my ideas regularly. Making prototypes in Figma and sharing them with others is the traditional approach for this. However, at the end of the day, nothing can really replace building a prototype of your idea in code. You can interact with it yourself, test its performance, and share it with others for feedback. I really believe that the closer you are to the metal, the better you can determine whether or not your ideas will actually create a great experience on your device. So before I actually design anything by hand for this project, I actually use Cursor to generate a bunch of prototypes for me. In my opinion, the very beginning of a project can be kind of daunting. You have this idea of what you want in your head, but you're not really sure you know, how you can get it out. And even when you do feel like you did get that idea out, you know, in practice, maybe it doesn't really feel that great. When I'm starting out, I like to use these AI tools to just give me a place to get some inspiration from, something that I can actually play with on my phone. Real quick, for anybody who hasn't heard of it, Cursor is an AI code editor that allows you to chat with the latest language models to generate code for you. And any photos, website links, or information that you put in that chat window is known as context. In order to increase the chances that a language model consistently provides you with solutions that align with your goals, you're gonna want to give it very specific and well-documented context. Pre-planning is really a superpower here, which is why I've gotten into the habit of writing a product requirements document whenever I need to think through a new app or a new feature. You usually use this document to keep everybody on a team setting um, on the same page, but in my case, I'm just feeding it to an AI model so that whenever I ask it to do something new, it stays on track and has something to reference. The reason that language models are kind of unpredictable is that they use probability to give you a solution that they think most aligns with what you're asking it to do based on the context. This means every time you ask a question, you are almost guaranteed to get a different answer. Even if they're similar, they'll never be exactly the same. And this characteristic kind of comes with advantages and disadvantages. The major advantage is that this makes language models incredible for like generating creative different ideas basically instantly. The major disadvantage of it is that it, it sacrifices consistency. It actually forgets, you know, the context of what you're trying to get it to do. You know, the longer you're talking to a language model, it's good to refresh and start a new chat because it will forget things and just start hallucinating random stuff. So if you've never written a PR you before, this is exactly how I did it. I always start with the main problem that I'm trying to solve. And that problem usually comes with a long list of smaller related problems. A simple trick I use all the time to figure out what I want to build is to think of those smaller problems as micro workflows that the app needs to support. And you can take those workflows, even if it's just one or two to begin with, and give it to ChatGPT and tell it to generate a PRD for you. It'll know exactly what you're talking about. I personally prefer using ChatGPT for this because I really like their Canvas editor. Uh, they were the first ones to come out with this Google Doc kind of experience, but you could highlight and refine different areas of the document instead of writing it by hand. That's the goal, right? Like we're just trying to get some sort of a document out here so that we can give it to Cursor and get a prototype. So I really like that workflow. Once you have it all written out, one thing to know is that AI models work really well with markdown files. Markdown is just much easier for them to understand than other formats like Word or PDFs. So I like to ask ChatGPT to convert it to a markdown file so that I can throw that into my project folder whenever I create my app. Because I'm building an iOS app, you might be wondering, you know, how exactly do I use cursor with Xcode? And there's actually only five steps to that. They're pretty simple. First things first is that you're gonna need a Mac. You wanna download cursor and Xcode. Second, you wanna make sure you have a lot of storage because Xcode alone is like 30 gigs or some shit. Step three is to create a project in Xcode. You can use their iOS default there. Don't have to change really anything. Just make sure you name the app and you're good. Step four, open up that project folder you just saved in cursor and then put Xcode and cursor on your computer, just side by side. And then off to the left in cursor, you can just pick a model and start chatting with it. By the way, now that you have your project folder, you can put that requirements document that you made earlier in that folder so that cursor can reference it. Once it's in there, all you need to do is use the at symbol in the chat and it should come up as an option. Also, I feel like mentioning, cause I had no idea, 
the content view.swift file is where you can just go and start designing. With iOS, every time you see the word view, they're really talking about like any type of screen or interface, it's all the same thing. When it comes to choosing a model to use for iOS development, I always go with the Claude Sonnet models. I found that like Swift UI, because it's relatively new, not a lot of models are like very well trained on it. I think every single model is super well trained on React, but when it comes to Swift, I think Claude is just exceptionally better than all the rest. And that's mostly coming from like, it just does what I ask it to do. <laughs> My benchmark there is that whatever it generated wasn't trash. I think I've been seeing on Twitter that like the Gemini models are actually okay. I haven't played with them myself, but just something to note. And while we're talking about models, these are some of the best practices that I picked up on while trying to get them to design for me. So in the past, I was always trying to get Claude to build me full features. I would say, you know, front end, back end, the whole thing. I just wanted to be fully functional. And not gonna lie, it's capable of doing that sometimes. But most of the time, what I found is that I was just getting in these bug loops. I was losing full days just going back and forth doing bugs instead of figuring out what my user flows were gonna be. Like I'm in the design phase right now. I'm gonna be in the design phase for a little while and it doesn't really help to get stuck for, you know, that, that's a long time. My recommendation would be to um, try to focus on one task at a time. I always ask the model to only design things. And I found that like I very rarely have any bugs when it comes to the front end stuff because Swift UI is pretty simple visually, right? You know. As soon as you get the functionality in there, we'll see. But I've made a lot more progress that way. And I know I mentioned it before, right? You wanna start new chats pretty frequently. But the thing is, when you're trying to debug something, this becomes more important because the longer you're talking, going back and forth with one of these models, all of a sudden they start hallucinating some code and you get stuck between one change that you made back here and that change just like keeps showing up somehow. It gets messy. And last thing I wanted to mention is that when it comes to context, you don't have to stop with like the requirements document. You can make spec documents for basically anything. You can make it for a design system. You can make it for, you know, code formatting, say that you want things to look a certain way. It can reference how you would like it to um, generate that code for you. You say that you have some dummy data that you need created in like a JSON file or something like that. And you needed that to be able to actually see what your design looks like. You could generate that with ChatGPT or any of these other LLMs and then put that into the project. You know, the more references you can give the model, the more likely it's gonna do exactly what you're looking for. So I took a screen recording and this is what Cursor generated for me. This is the first prototype of this content planning app that I, that I made just to give me some ideas. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't complete by any means, but what surprised me was how deep it went into the screen flows for me. I really value just being able to like study this thing. This is what helped me get some ideas before I moved into Figma. To be honest, when I got to this point, I kept asking myself like, why use Figma at all? Like in theory, I could just keep designing in Cursor. And what I say is Cursor is the obvious choice for any like complex interactions where they're kind of hard to visualize in like a static format. Any mobile native features, those are kind of hard to design in Figma, honestly. Shaders are a good example. It'd be important to see like how the shader actually looks and performs on the device. I'd imagine it's kind of hard to mock up like AI functionality. The tokens are literally streaming, you know, so it'd probably be better on, on an actual device. But there's still a really strong use case for using Figma. If you have an idea that you really want to run with, you can flush that out in Figma and then, you know, export the mockup and feed it to cursor as a reference. So this is one of those cases where like a picture literally is worth a thousand words. Whenever you feed a photo to cursor, it's using something called a vision language model, which essentially just takes the photo and analyzes it and turns that into like a written description. And that written description is what it uses as context to do whatever you're asking it to do. This past week, I made some changes to the home and create tab in Figma. I basically asked it to make me a pixel perfect replica and and on the first try, it did it like, I would say 70% of the way there. Uh, there's, you can see some UI elements that are on the prototype that actually weren't in the design originally. And I like that kind of stuff. I think it's okay. And one of the more powerful things here is that if you don't want to design things by hand, you could even go to something like Mobbin or any of the screenshots that you've collected over time 
and use them to create a starting point for yourself. So even when I was going through like a hundred iterations in Figma, if I ran out of ideas, I could just send it to Cursor for feedback and you know ask it what I can do better. Every single time it's gonna tell you something. Yeah, I feel like visual language models make Figma more useful, not less. It's gonna be kind of crazy when these things are capable of analyzing videos, cause then you can use them for like motion mockups, generating those, it's gonna get cool. I ran out of daylight yesterday, but today, as promised, I wanted to go over where I'm at with the current prototype design. While I was moving in, Apple released their Liquid Glass UI, which I've already added into any of like the navigational or action elements on my screen. You can see here at the bottom, this tab bar has this kind of liquidy effect as you scroll through each of the tabs. I think it's pretty sweet and it kind of reacts to the background, whatever's behind it. Um, and there's a really simple like modifier that they give you so that when you scroll down on the screen, it actually minimizes to the corner to get out of your way so that the content can be seen. Um, and I love that, I think that's pretty slick. I wanna add a like a floating action button like I used to have in the design um, here at the bottom. I guess there's some sort of like a, a role that you can give uh, one of your tabs for search, but I've seen people and Apple themselves have this like separate loading action button. So you have some sort of action and then you have the tab bar just kind of like off to the side. And I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but my plan is to keep that there so that I can create a new note or a new idea whenever I need to. By the way, I renamed this tab from journal to home and simplified it a little bit. I personally think the highest leverage way to make content is to come up with some sort of like a series or a show in relation to one of your personal goals. For example, one of my goals is to build and publish my first app. And so I feel like I have this like never ending cycle of different content ideas that are coming to me as I'm like growing and learning and I work towards that. But building out a series is a very like long term and focused and kind of messy commitment. So it's very important to me that this app allows me to keep the planning of every episode and short form piece of content in one place. Also wanna be able to easily hop back into a project. That's why I've moved the series and shows section here to the top of the home screen. Maybe if I want to, you know, take one of the scripts that I use in the past and refine it and make it better for the next one, I should be able to do that pretty easily. So to me, hopping into one of these folders is one of the core actions of the app. And I have it separated here from, you know, long form and short form series. And in each series card, I've added a quick indicator here at the bottom of which platforms that I've posted in relation to that series. I've said this before, but I think it's good to keep track of which topics you're spending time talking about on each platform. And I'm playing around with having these circles actually match the colors that are gonna be in the content calendar just to make sure that everything's cohesive. So that pretty much covers my thinking for the home tab so far. Now let's talk about the create tab. The main purpose of this tab is to be a blank slate for quick capturing ideas for me. I'm trying to be super careful not to fill this UI with too much when it's launched from the home screen. All my favorite quick capture and writing apps launch quickly and don't distract me away from the idea that I have at hand. By far, I know I'm gonna be using this part of the app probably more than anything else, just because of the way that ideas stream in. So I wanted to introduce a way to jump back into one of the most recent three pieces of content that I might've been editing. And even looking at this now, I'm actually kind of considering reducing it to one, just to give me more space on the text editing side. You know, in reality, you know, am I gonna really be working on three pieces of content at once? Probably not, probably gonna flush one out, move on to the next one. So going over the toolbar at the top, here's what I've got for placeholders from left to right. First, I have a simple inbox icon, and all this is gonna do is open up a modal coming from the left that has a list of any unfinished or unprocessed ideas that I can go through and process later. My intention is to also make it possible to swipe from left to right to open up this modal, but I think it's good to have both options. Next to the inbox icon, I've added a plus icon to create a new note in case I have a secondary idea that comes to me while I'm thinking of another one, just so that I don't lose it. And I didn't wanna have another floating action button here on the writing area, so, I had to create some sort of a dedicated space for that. Then up in the top center, I have a button to add a tag. As I was talking about before, you know, processing these things is really important. I wanna be able to organize them fairly easily. And I don't want the system to be too complex, otherwise I know I'm just not gonna do it. So what I'm thinking about right now is, you know, if this idea relates to an episode or a series or, you know, my current goal or maybe a specific platform, if I'm gonna be capturing a lot of ideas, my hope is to be able to organize them in the way 
that they'll show up in the proper context and I can use them later. Up on the right hand side, I have an undo and redo buttons. And I feel like a lot of writing apps right now that I'm using don't actually have these. Uh, most people just opt for, you know, shaking your phone and having like that undo option, which is always there. And maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe, maybe it's something that's hard to implement, but I really do miss having that type of option. And lastly, I have another sidebar icon and this is gonna bring up another modal that has content related actions and units that I can throw into the script. So my idea right now is the cursor, wherever it's at, I can just go ahead and like insert different things. Maybe that's like different formats or structures. And depending on how capable the text editor ends up being, you know, I'd really like to be able to like highlight parts of my script and maybe add shot list stuff to them or something. I don't know, I wanna get creative with the text editor. And I click that, it's gonna open up a sheet from the right to the left. Same thing here, you know, if I swipe from right to left, I would want that that modal to show up too. So that's something I'll probably do in the future. That's another system I'm thinking about, but definitely something that I feel like I'm gonna use constantly. So the writing itself, when I click here, you can see that I have this formatting toolbar right above the keyboard. And I might keep this or I might translate it to the new Glass UI, just because the way that they've created the Glass UI, it's very dynamic. So, you know, there might be a better user experience that's now possible that I wasn't really thinking through when I first did this part. So I think there's some exploration that I wanna do there. But yeah, this is simple stuff, being able to add headings, bullet points, numbered lists, and some styling to the words. I think all of that is pretty important when it comes to script writing. And as soon as I start typing, you can see that I made it so that the recent activity bar has faded away, you might've noticed that. If for any reason I wanna dismiss it with a swipe, I can do that as well. I can also dismiss the keyboard pretty easily. I have this handle here at the top of the formatting bar that will get rid of it. Or I can use this keyboard icon on the far right and that'll dismiss it too. So that pretty much covers the create tab. All that's left here is the profile tab and it, Cursor gave me this for free. I'm actually probably gonna scrap it, but it is nice to have some kind of like a starting point. Yeah, if you're here from the first video, thanks for coming back, thanks for watching. I hope you found this valuable and informative anyway, that's my goal. Definitely let me know what you wanna see more of in the next one and I'll see you then.